This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha. Welcome to What's On Your Mind Hawaii, a new show format that takes our camera out of the studio and out into the streets to hear from you and those issues which are important. Today's show, we listen to Mateo Caballero, legal director from the ACLU, about efforts to reduce jail overcrowding and allow those charged with the ability to make bail. Also, we will talk about the reversal of the United States net neutrality policy. And our last interview is an interesting conversation about how much more difficult it is to get ahead in America. I'm here at the ACLU uh, Liberty Unions to talk about bail reform. And I'm here with Mateo Caballero. He's the legal director for the ACLU here in the Hawaii chapter. And uh, Mateo, you just gave a presentation on your efforts and your proposed efforts in bail reform in the state of Hawaii. Tell me a little bit about it. Sure. So uh, let me take a step back and tell you why we're working on bail reform and, and why now. So. Um, well, the first reason is that Hawaii has had uh, overcrowding and, you know, really inhumane conditions uh, at its jails and prisons for a very long time, going back to the 80s. Uh, and this is one of those uh, recurring and very difficult to tackle problems in Hawaii. Uh, all our jails are overcrowded. They are about, uh, they operate at double their uh, design capacity. Uh, they have the people in, in jail. Uh, and just to explain to your audience what is the difference between jail and prison, uh, you know, jails are places where people are housed uh, for short periods of time, meaning uh, pre-trial detainees, people that are waiting trial but haven't been convicted of anything, uh, people that perhaps uh, ha are parole or probation violators, or uh, folks that are uh, convicted of misdemeanors. Uh, but our, our jails are just full of people that are there pre-trial, essentially because they cannot afford bail. To what degree is Hawaii, what's the ranking of Hawaii compared to other states as far as pre-jail um, people that are in, that didn't make bail, that are in, in prison or, or in jail? So uh, Hawaii is, is very much in line with other states. Uh, I believe the national average is actually a little bit higher than Hawaii's, uh, where 70% of people uh, in jail are there pre-trial. Mm -hmm. uh, in Hawaii, as I said, it's about 50%. Of course, different states use their jails a little bit differently. Hawaii is somewhat unique in that it's one of the few states where the state operates the jails and the prisons. In, in most places, the jails are operated by the counties. And in, in Hawaii, that used to be the case, but that changed uh, in the 70s. So during the presentation, you mentioned that in pre-trial status, uh, the state is spending $147, I believe, per, per individual. Is that correct? Yes, it's $146 per day. And uh, this is, again, according to the Department of Public Safety's own numbers. And that translates at the current rate of incarceration for pre-trial detainees to about uh, $61 million per year. 61 million a year? Yes. Just in Hawaii State? Just on pre-trial detainees. So uh, we, we spend a lot more, uh, you know, as part of the Department of Public Safety, but this is how much the Department of Public Safety spends to keep someone in jail that is, is pre-trial, you know, hasn't been convicted of anything, should be presumed innocent, but for some reason or another is, you know, is, cannot afford bail or cannot post bail. What are the top three reasons for people not making bail and getting you know, being released on their own cognizance? So uh, the, the main three reasons, the first one is, is that bail in Hawaii is very, very high. Uh, as, as you know, uh, you know, we have, uh, we live in one of the most expensive states. Uh, our wages are relatively low compared to the cost of living. And yet, uh, the bail amounts set by the judges, which for the most part follow schedules, uh, are very, very high. So that most people in Hawaii cannot afford to post bail. So that's the first reason. The second reason is that- now Let me just interrupt on that point. Is there a difference in bail amounts based on a violent crime versus a non-violent crime? Yes, so the, the, the schedules uh, that, you know, judges follow and, and they are 
by the way, not necessarily written schedules, they are kind of de facto schedules. Uh, they, um, they do differentiate between the type of crime, uh, which to some extent is problematic because the idea of, of bail is that, or cash bail, I should say, is that uh, it makes sure that you reappear in court. However, uh, you know, it, 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 if you think about it, it, it doesn't make sense that it, it would depend on the type of offense because, uh, you know, essentially the wealthy person that murders someone could get out on bail, but the, you know, the poor person that just uh, stole, you know, uh, like a pair of sunglasses uh, will, will be in jail until, until trial. What are the bail amounts uh, typically here in Hawaii? So the bail amounts have a wide range. Uh, for uh, felony, the classy felonies is, is between normally between eleven thousand and fifteen thousand dollars. And by the way, we over classify in Hawaii. So we have a lot of things that are, for example, mere possession of any drug, uh, with the exception of marijuana, is a classy felony. Uh, and then class Bs and class As kind of go up from there. Uh, I, I don't have the numbers. My colleague Ainsley would, would be able to give you. The exact numbers for those, but I know we have had situations where bail is set as high as like a million dollars, right. and that's not the norm across the nation. There are other places where bail is much less than that. So, other than cash bail requirements, what are a couple more uh, situations why people are not um, they're still in pre-jail, pre-trial jail? So, the other reason people are held pre-trial is because um, it takes a long time for uh, judges here to either reduce bail or to essentially release someone on uh, with some sort of you know conditional release and and you know no one really knows exactly why that's the case but we have very very long periods in fact it takes here in the first circuit on Oahu it takes about 61 days on average to get someone out of jail uh, sometimes even on their own recognizance and, and what I've heard is that it has to do with the time it takes sometimes for uh, the pretrial risk assessment uh, to take place but that's that's really outside of the norm in terms of national averages. In most places, you're out of, uh, of jail within a couple of weeks. But for some reason here in Hawaii, it takes four times that long. Uh, so th that's one of the reasons you, you, we have a, a lot of people in jail. And I understand uh, another reason was that judges kind of just follow, follow a cookbook kind of formula on whether they release or not release someone on bail. Is that kind of accurate? So what, what happened with judges is that uh, what the initial bail is normally set by the police. And the police normally you know, follow some sort of guideline, as you said, based on uh, the crime that, that was committed. And so when it comes for the judge, the judge essentially follows that same guideline and kind of affirms the amount set by the police, unless really there is some sort of showing that they should deviate from that. And that kind of puts things on its head, because the idea of bail is that it should be individualized, and that due process requires that the judge looks, looks at you and determines, are you a danger to society? Are you uh, a flight risk? And then tries to determine what is the best set of bail conditions that they should impose. And cash is not the only way you can release someone. You could have someone on house arrest. Mm -hmm. You could have curfews. You could have uh, someone to get text. You could have ankle monitoring. There are a number of ways you can release someone uh, and, and make sure they appear or make sure they do not commit another crime. And that's kind of what we're seeing across the nation, uh, that you know places are realizing that cash is not a very good option for, for bail. Okay, step over this way here a little bit. Um, as we move into the new uh, 2018 legislative session, I heard that there are going to be some proposed, hopefully some proposed bills that address bail reform. Can you kind of summarize what those might look like? So I haven't seen them, and I haven't seen the, the bills yet. We hope uh, by right before legislative session to have our own set of requirements for those bills and what we think they should look like. So there's going to be a bill report that uh, will summarize all the data that uh, you know our one of our fellows has gathered over the span of six months, essentially looking at every case in circuit court between January 2017 and June 2017, and just seeing what are the bill setting practices in Hawaii, and then based on that data, we, we made recommendations as to how uh, and what types of reforms we need here in Hawaii. What kind of battle do you anticipate in the legislature over this issue? So, you know, th this is one of those issues where the evidence is very clear. 
which is that you could release a lot more people and, and have better results. You know, it costs less money to the state to just supervise someone uh, out in the community than to house them in, in OCCC, uh, which cost, as, I, as we said, $146. So the evidence is in our favor. Other states are doing, you know, are having really good results with bail reform. Uh, the, 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 main cons the, the main issue is really fear, fear of change, fear that if you let someone out, that person is going to commit a, you know, a crime, uh, and then there's going to be political backlash either against the legislature or against the judges. And, and a lot of lay people, you know, they... Uh, they how, do you, how do you approach that risk-reward equation with a legislator? Uh, because you're right, it's, it is a big concern that by making these reforms that there is the opportunity that, you know, that one person that gets released or should have been, in, you know, incarcerated, wasn't incarcerated, then all of a sudden now that person has recommitted a crime and it doesn't look good for anyone. Yeah, well, th th there are a couple of things. The, the first one is that uh, our current system really doesn't deal with that issue either. Essentially, it's all about whether you have the ability to pay or not. And if someone can pay, they get out and they still can commit another crime. So it, it's not like a, the current system is really keeping us safer. Uh, the, the other issue is that ultimately it's about following the evidence and, and seeing you know what the results are in, in other places. And in Hawaii, the fact of the matter is that we have very very high uh, reoffending rates. You know, people that go to jail and prison and then get out and then commit another crime. And and people don't see that as a failure of the system. They don't see that as a failure of the state to rehabilitate someone. But we should be as concerned about that failure as we are about that person that gets out and, and commits another crime. And, and once we have that shift, when we start realizing that in fact the state of Hawaii is failing to rehabilitate people and therefore we're, you know, it's more dangerous for us, then, then I, I'm hoping they will realize that it's not about that you know, one case, it's really about looking at the wider system and whether it's working or not. Okay, well, Mateo, I want to thank you very much for spending your time with Think Tech Hawaii. I'm here with Calvin, and Calvin, uh, I'd like to ask you about what your opinion is about the net neutrality issue that was just decided on today to do a complete reversal of the existing policies. What's, what, what's on your mind about that? Um, basically, I think, um, you know, first of all, I'm opposed to the whole thing because um, I believe every consumer should have their own, you know, choice of what they would want to do and who they would want to, you know, choose as far as providers and shouldn't have to worry about having their services filtered. Um, but I think also um, being that I am in the, in the tech industry, um, there, there are workarounds. So, and I think the biggest thing right now for, I think the average person is to realize that there is a VPN solution. So. Are you concerned about um, issues of monopolies and uh, the, big, the big existing media companies taking over the broadband space and then kind of edging out all the smaller providers? Absolutely. Um, I think that's, you know, the key in this. I think, you know, anytime there's, you know, a big change in our society, you also have to worry about, okay, what's going on on the back end? You know, there, there's, there's got to be something to make, something going on in the back end to make a move like this to, uh, to seem justifiable. I mean, it hasn't been a problem in, in our country for years, and now all of a sudden this is a big issue, you know, as we move forward in the 20th century. You would mentioned before we started the interview about uh, what I think a lot of people don't know about. It's called VP. VPNs, yes, okay. VPNs. Tell me about that. Uh, virtual private network. So virtual private networks have been around for a long time. Uh, there's various flavors to them. I think um, the average, like I said, the average, uh, you know, average person or consumer is just something that they just really don't, they, they don't really know about unless they're in, they're, they're pretty tech savvy. So um, it goes on to this day. A lot of the kids are into it now, but there's all type of applications out there for them. Is that a way of uh, gaining access without going through the, the major media companies like AT&T and all those um, big firms? Um, yes, I, I think you, you know, you still would, you know, use one of those guys as your your uh, your service provider, but um, by the same token, you still can use a VPN solution within your own home. So you can connect to outside, you know, networks, and you can tunnel traffic through. And that way, you can see uh, things that are filtered. So um, yeah, I think VPNs is probably the, the, the way to go. So. Have you had any discussions with your friends or family about this issue? 
Um, yeah, everybody just it just says that they're they're, they're going to do VPNs. Everybody I know who I work with, they just said, hey, you know, if it passes, we'll just you know we'll just I'll set up a VPN. So how easy is it to do that? Um, you definitely you, you definitely would need to know something about you know um, you know technology in order to set it up, but. Um, there are all different ways. There's different things that you can do to, to, to get it set up. So, um, you know, the average person, you just Google VPNs or reach out to somebody you know that may know a little something about um, technology. Sounds like a business opportunity. Someone just set up a VPN, VPS consulting service. Uh, definitely, definitely. There's probably, you know, opportunities out there for people, but more importantly, I think it's just a way, a, a solution to allow people to continue to view and, 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 and look at content that, you know, they, you know, so wish and please to. So this net neutrality really just concerns the United States, correct? I mean, it doesn't really affect Canada or, or any of our other our neighbors or anything like that. It's just primarily the United States is affected by this policy. Is, it, is that your understanding? Yeah, that's my understanding. It's just the United States. I know there's a lot of countries outside of us that, you know, have their own policies in place uh, till this day. So uh, it's just, you know, uh, uh, it's unfortunately that it has to hit home now. Do you have any um, theories as to why all of a sudden we're doing a 180 on this policy that's already been established in the Obama administration era? Do you think there's any, um, any real motivation to change this policy that's pretty ingrained already now? Um... No, no, I, you know, I, 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 I can't, I really wouldn't, you know, I really don't have no comment for that, but um, it, it does seem, it, it, it does seem a little, a little suspicious, but, you know. Well, actually it does, it looks like just about every policy that uh, President Obama implemented is being reversed um, on his face, just absolutely reversed, so it doesn't surprise a lot of people, but um, the, the ramifications could be pretty good, they're pretty big actually, and um, just wondered if, if most people really thought about that and the implications are going to have down the road. Yeah, um, you know, yeah, I, 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 I can't really comment on that, but it, I, it definitely will have some uh, implications on uh, down the road. And I think that, um, you know, it, it, it's just unfortunate. Like I said, for me, it's just, it's just unfortunate we're in a, in, in a situation. And I think that with the administration that's in place, it seems like, you know, that's all they're, they've been focused on. It's just, you know, um, you know, overturning and undoing what Obama has already put into place. So. so if you had any advice for someone who's not tech savvy and reading the headlines about the reversal of net neutrality, mm -hmm. what would you say to them? What would you say? Don't worry. Or would you have any advice for them? Um, I would just say, hey, you know, you Pick up a book, Google, whatever you do, find out about VPN solutions, and um, just set one up as quick as you can. You know, that, that would be my advice to them, you know. Um, other than that, I mean, that, that, that's really, that really seems like the only um, uh, 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 alternative solution in this case. So, yeah, get a VPN. Okay. <laughs> Calvin, I want to thank you very much. This is Tim Apicella, and we're on the streets of Waikiki. And this is What's on Your Mind Hawaii for Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Gene, what's on your mind? We, we, before we started the interview, we talked about uh, the future and your grandchildren. So let's go from there. Yeah, the, the world I live in is greatly dictated today by what I see out ahead for my grandchildren. And uh, I'm not optimistic. I'm not optimistic that the world I live in has changed dramatically in the years I've been here. And whereas it was the land of opportunity when I came, that, you came in 1964. 64, yes. And uh, when I, ca I came to California, when I came to California, California at that time was probably the greatest place that had ever existed in the history of mankind. Well, this I have to hear why. How? For the common man. And the common man did remarkably well. And the common man did remarkably well for a number of reasons. One, uh, there was a part-time legislature. There was just a limited amount of damage the politicians could do. Uh, two, there was no withholding tax. Uh, despite that, California had an infrastructure that was absolutely pristine. Um, this, the public school system in California, I think you measure countries and, and states by the, the quality of educa public education. And uh, the public school system in California when I came was the best in the country at a time when the nation's schools were the best in the industrialized world. And uh, today, California schools rank 48th, I believe, in the nation, and uh, the nation's schools are on the bottom of the G20, number 20, and they're in the bottom of the industrialized world. 
And well, I, you, you should know because Ireland, I believe, had one of the best school systems in the entire world. It, it started out when I was a youngster, a uh, very, very poor system uh, because you s simply didn't have the resources. But in time, they, they changed and in, in, in the late 60s, they uh, set about rebuilding the schools, uh, rebuilding the curriculum, and doing everything they could to invite foreign investment. What's your concern for your grandchildren specifically? Is it, uh, is it the environment? Is it the education system? Is it a whole uh, multitude of things? I suppose a multitude of things. Um, the, the incentives to work have been greatly reduced. I mean, this is a state with an enormous welfare system. California is a state with an enormous welfare system. Uh, and so there are fewer and fewer people paying in to support that, and more and more people being incentivized not to go to work. It happened to me. I paid so much taxes that I, I retired early, you know, from a wonderful job and uh, that I loved, but uh, I was just working for the tax man. And I think uh, most of my friends... Were you, you were self-employed or did you work for a corporation? I, I worked uh, both, actually, mm -hmm. through my lifetime. And, and uh, the burden became incredibly uh, steep for uh, the amount of effort. The reward became very little for the amount of effort you were putting in. And uh, it's just, it has grown. System, the system has grown. With this pending tax uh, reform, if you are, or tax cut, however you want to look at it, that Donald Trump and his administration has proposed, you, you know that the corporation tax is going from 35 down to a proposed 21%. Do you think that's going to filter down to the middle class of this country? Uh, the middle class is almost non-existent in the world I live in. Uh, it, where I live, it's all very well-off people or people who are on welfare for the most part. Middle class has been pretty much gutted. Um, yeah, I think anything that uh, encourages investment in the country is good and uh, certainly is a bad thing to have, to have these enormous corporations keep the money offshore. I mean, Apple has like a quarter of a trillion dollars bank in, in a bank in Ireland, for God's sake. It's, it's so, in your mind, um, you just made a statement, which I think is rather dramatic, and that is the middle class has been squeezed out. Oh, yeah. If you're a student of history, you know that government insurrection and, and rioting and revolution usually occurs when there's the haves and have-nots and there's not a middle class. Are you concerned about that? I am concerned about that long term. It's one of the things that, that concerns me about my, uh, the world that my grandchildren are going into. Um, first of all, they have to uh, deal with the advances in technology, which are not necessarily favorable to creating jobs for everyone. And the other thing that, that's going on is, is uh, robotics. That, that this, in 10 years, we won't recognize the world we're in. Robotics will take jobs uh, by the score every day, by every month. And so you have to compete with that. Issue is largely being dismissed at this point and oh, saying no. that we're going back to the blue collar uh, industries of the 60s and the 50s. No. Absolutely not. There's, there's no uh, turning back the clock in terms of, of technology. Here we are, you know, playing with these toys ourselves. And it's remarkable, but it doesn't lead to a lot of new jobs. And it doesn't lead a lot to a lot of well-paying jobs. There'll be a lot of uh, poor, poorer paying jobs, but there'll be a handful at the top, I think, and everybody else will be scrambling. The neighborhood I live in is a beautiful neighborhood. When I went to live in it, it was all middle-class folks. Today, it's hedge fund managers, attorneys, and doctors. And, and me. <laughs> well, let me ask you this, because um, I'm concerned about my children and their children. Yeah. And what advice do we give them, whether the cost of education now could run you 75, 100,000, 150,000 more? Um, what advice do we give our, our children and our grandchildren regarding education and, and what they should be doing? Should they go directly into industry or should they go to school and, and try to uh, enhance their skills that way? If I knew the answer to that question, I'd be a very wealthy man <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's a, I don't think anybody knows, and least of all people in government. You know, I think that they are out of touch with, uh, with the world. And uh, so we'll see how it plays out. Well, we know that unemployment's a huge factor whether or not we have um, basically low crime rates mm -hmm. and prosperity for the entire nation. And uh, certainly has an effect on you know the economy and GNP and the increase of GNP. Um, do you think this tax cut's going to get us there? Uh, President Trump is just today, I think, or yesterday, was uh, estimating that we could be five, six percent GNP with the uh, corporate rate cut and some of these tax revisions. And that seems a little aggressive and a little bit uh, fairy book strategy. But uh, what do you think? Well, I hope he's right. 
Well, I hope so, so, so too, but you think he's realistic in that? Well, I think there, there are, are you know, I, I look at everything from the, the, the prison living in California. And uh, so you drop the rate to 21% in California and you're Apple. You bring it back and Jerry Brown adds another 13.9% on top of that. And you're going to say, gosh, that wasn't such a great deal after all, you know? So I think uh, that those large companies that are um, have their, their uh, base in uh, the high tax states, I don't think they're going to be greatly incentivized to haul money back in. And uh, I think in, in the states, for instance, where you come from up in, in Washington, they don't have an income tax, do they? They should benefit, Microsoft, for instance, should, should benefit mightily from this. And, uh, but I don't see Apple uh, hauling their money back or Yahoo or, or you know, Facebook. I think they're going to concentrate on, on ha investing abroad rather than at home, which I think is terrible. Well, that is the argument. That's, that's the whole rationale for cutting the corporate tax, that that's going to bring that offshore money back in the United States. Um, you know, there are corporations and many of them out there that are sitting on a ton of cash. And so the question is, why are we giving them further tax incentive when they're already sitting on mountains of cash and they're not re necessarily reinvesting it into equipment or, you know, maybe they're buying their stock back, but they're not necessarily reinvesting it in the employees or the education of employees or certainly uh, capital uh, capital improvements. I think if they give them the, the right incentives to bring it back home in a, in a flash, if you had a zero tax rate. They turned this country into the greatest uh, free enterprise zone in the world. Everyone would want to come and work here. And uh, you would generate a lot of tax from that. I, d I don't know how. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> I don't know I've, got to, I've got to ask you a follow-up question on that. Are we talking about a 0% corporate tax or? Corporate tax. Corporate tax. Yeah, okay. Money that's offshore. Yeah, and I'm talking about offshore money. This idea of taxing offshore money is a, is a loser. And uh, if you have the option to take the money off, if you didn't have to pay a tax and you had earnings offshore, would you bring them back home? No, you go visit your money once in a while and enjoy it there, wouldn't you? That's true. It depends <laughs> on what country it's in, I suppose. Well, you know, if you could take it out tax-free, you could take it somewhere else, right? But it's uh, this, this idea of taxing money that's earned offshore is a loser, I think. And I don't know that any other country does that. Uh, I may be wrong, but I, I don't think too many of the, the major countries in the world tax offshore earnings. If you had any recommendations for how this administration or even future administrations proceed either in the form of taxation or, you know, just making America a better place to be, what would be your top two things that you could think of that we really should strive for as far as improvement? Uh, for example, is it, is it a shot to the moon? Is the new announcement of a moonshot? Is that the way we go or is it something else? <laughs> I think um, it, it's a tough one. I think uh, you reduce taxes and uh, regulation. And uh, I think uh, regulation has become the uh, the monster that's ruining everything in this country. Uh, and I don't know how true this is, but I read an article recently and it suggested that the last year of the Obama administration, there was 91,000 pages of regulation added to the National Register, uh, the Federal Register. And the year before that, 85,000. And the year before that, 80,000. And every page of regulation has a cost to the taxpayer. You're going to have bureaucrats that are going to get on them. Well, the bureaucrats can't even enforce their own regulations. That's I, I, the problem. So. Sure, but they know how to hire people and make their departments bigger, right? You know? And, 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 uh, and if you take a look at what's happening, you know, it's the size of government and it's the cost of government is the real problem. And, and you have friends who work for, you know, the city of, of Honolulu or the state of Hawaii. And you see the pensions they get. I mean, we had a bus driver in our county retire recently, and his pension was five times what uh, one of the trades, um, I can't remember which one of the trades, and, and the guy, the, the tradesman had like 50 years in, the, the bus driver had 35 years in. That's been in our paper, and that is called gaming the system, where oh, you're getting crazy. overtime, you're getting overtime for four years, yeah. you have a look back of five years, yeah. and therefore your normal salary wouldn't even come close to that pension payout, so. It's one of the great sins in, 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 <laughs> that we have to endure, but this idea that you can spike your pension. I could tell you stories all day long about friends I want who spike their pension, yeah. And, and, and it's, it's stunning. It's been in the paper. So, yeah. well, Gene, I want to thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and sharing what was on your mind today. I'm Tim Apicello with Gene, and, and Gene and I are going to say aloha. And aloha. thank you, aloha, and thank you for tuning in to What's on Your Mind, Hawaii. I want to say thank you very much for joining us this week for What's on Your Mind, Hawaii. Please join us in two weeks from now on January the second, two thousand and eighteen. 
Uh, and also, if you have something important on your mind that you think you would like to be interviewed for, I'd love to hear from you. So please contact me at this following uh, email address, apicella58 at gmail.com. Again, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you in a couple weeks. Aloha.